to everybody who came out tonight uh, to celebrate this month of October that's been termed Pastor's Appreciation Month. And I know people are celebrating all over the place, but I can tell you some people will see the stories that we posted tonight and, and be inspired. But you see, my wife is born again and sanctified. You know, I was going to say they will be jealous, but that would be the overflow of wickedness in it. But they will be inspired more like it. It is not our mission to make people jealous, but it is our mission to inspire people. We are light, Jesus says, but we are not supposed to be blinding light. We're supposed to be light that helps others to see. You know, because people in the world, when they have any little light, their light is to blind you. You know, they don't want you to see, but we want people to see. Praise the Lord. God is good. So by the grace of God, we will touch on a couple of things tonight. Um, we have a testimony that is coming our way, uh, not immediately, so you can take care of Caleb if you would. Um, Alan and Diamond, it is their wedding anniversary today. Praise the Lord. And the Lord God has given them already an anniversary present. You know, last uh, on Saturday, my wife led us through a prayer declaring over us that we are for signs and wonders. You understand what I mean? Because the Bible says, as for me and the children that you have given to me, we are for signs and wonders. And Alan came up really excited, you know, after that prayer and he declared, oh, we are the signs and we are the wonders. Sometimes be careful what you pray for. Because before the end of that day, they truly became a sign and a wonder. And so they'll come up in just a little bit and they will, uh, they'll come up sometime tonight. Let's not make promises we can't keep. When you say in just a little bit, someone is thinking two, three minutes. <laughs> but a little bit here at Communion House uh, could be more like when Jesus says, I'm coming soon. <laughs> you know, Jesus says, I'm coming shortly. And it's like, okay, I don't know how shortly, shortly is in heaven, but we're still waiting. So they will be coming up uh, in, the, in the course of tonight. For now, I want to encourage us on a number of things. But before I go ahead, I want to thank God for the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I want to thank God for the revelations and the insights. I want to thank God that even though darkness covers the earth and grows darkness to people, we have continued to enjoy such illumination here at Communion House. Praise the Lord. The Bible says that the Lord will not leave us comfortless. And so we are here and we continue to enjoy that promise that the Lord God Almighty made when he said, Will I do a thing without first revealing it to my servants, the prophets? We do not take these things lightly. We don't take it lightly when we see that the world is thinking that this is going on in the world, but the reality of it is that as children of God, we see something totally different. You understand what I mean? It is not a mean privilege. You understand what I mean? It isn't. Manuelina? Yeah? Oh, okay, I thought you were saying something. God is doing. You see, one of the things that uh, I have shared with you that I keep bringing up is... If truly we are what God says we are, if we are a royal priesthood, so we're not just priests that serve the crown. We are also the crown. You know, there's a difference. You know, back in the day, the Gentile nations will have priests, mostly eunuchs, whose lives are completely dedicated to serving the God or whatever God or gods are approved by the king. And sometimes the king imposes himself also as a god. Right? So the kings of ancient times were gods. And they also had other gods that they would bow to. And the priests were, were dedicated to helping the king serve their gods. In a way, they had privileges, but to be honest, it was a life of servitude. They didn't really get anything out of it. 
it, whether they believed or not, they have no choice. If they were born to that family, that was all they did. They couldn't even choose any other thing in life. So when you think about what God has done with us, not only are we priests, but we are also a royal priesthood because we are kings and priests. Now, I prefer that to just being a priest. Because when you are just a priest, all you're doing is serving based on the approval of another. Following the discretion of another. But when you are royalty, all of your service and all of your worship is for the furtherance of a kingdom that you have become a part of. Which means there is really no reason to hold back your service. There is no reason for you to seek to serve another because the place where you have come to call home is also the place where you were. One of the very first examples that we saw in scripture of a man who was a king and a priest who in fact was raised by God to give us a glimpse of what the rest of us were or are to expect and experience was King David. David was a king, he was a priest, and he was also a prophet. Before himself, we had a king who was not a priest. And so he would go looking for someone to talk to God on his behalf. And that was King Saul. And the danger of that is when you're a king and you are not a priest, you can easily be misled. And you are always in search for an oracle. You're always looking for someone to tell you that God is happy with you. You're always looking to receive approval from another. The same way a priest that is not a king can only serve to appease or, or serve to obtain the approval of the king, a king who is not a priest also has to do that. Now, many of us in Christianity and in this world in general have been raised to think that we can only be one or the other. Because when you recognize that you are both, it is very empowering and most people don't want you to be empowered so that they can always overpower you. But we have come to a time wherein we don't have to be like Saul. When God has shown us a man like David. And that was the reason why David, whenever he needed to obtain the mercy of God, he will go himself to the temple and he will lay hold of the horns of the altar. And cry out to God himself simply because he knew that he also was a priest. And if you want to find out exactly what happened to Saul and David and why they were both different, the main reason is that David's heart was so committed to chasing after God and nothing else. That is the main difference. But when it comes to the rituals surrounding their coronation, when Saul received the word of the Lord from Samuel, he was supposed to go out and obtain certain things, but he took only one, I believe, out of the three items that he could have taken. And that was why he could only function as a king. But when you look at David, when David was, when David was anointed to be king, he went out and he obtained all three. He got the bread, I think he got the meat, and he also got something else. And so he was able to function in all of those three capacities. And so there was something that was done. Something took place. Okay, so if you, if you want to get deep into it, I'm just giving you pointers as to the things that you will find. And the reason why Saul chose only one instead of three was because of the fact that his heart was not like the heart of David. His heart was more about who he was and who he can be to the people. Because he was already from a wealthy family and he was the tallest man in the land. The Bible says he was shoulder higher than everybody else. And so there was really no room for God because he was already so full of himself. You understand what I mean? He had so many of these abilities that were supposed to be sacrifices, but then they became edifices. 
You know, so when you think about the life of Saul and how Saul ended up being different from David, it's because God was showing us that when it comes to the assignment that he has for us, none of our abilities are supposed to replace God. None of the things that we do well are supposed to be an opportunity for us to sing. Okay, God, I can sing well. You don't have to come today. I, I, I can sing. When it comes to anything else, I may need you. But this one, I got this. You see, and God is like, no, no. When I give you anything that stands out in the crowd, if you have any advantage over others, I am making it easy for you to recognize where the item of sacrifice is. Because the taller you are, the more prostrate you need to be in my presence. Because you must reduce if I would increase. You see, but Saul did not recognize that those things were meant to be sacrifices. He thought that he needed to just continue to remain an edifice amongst the people sharing in the glory. You see, but David, on the other hand, he was born uh, into a very embarrassing situation. His father, who was supposed to be the speaker of the house, uh, back in the day, the title was called, he was called the head of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin were like the Senate, right, in the land of Israel. So his father was the head of the Sanhedrin, and he got somebody pregnant who was one of the maids living in their house. He was one of the, uh, the, the women that poured water on the hands of, uh, of, of his wife, of his, of his, the wife of his youth, his older wife. And, uh, and he was so embarrassed, you know, because of all of the things that, you know, people expected of him. And so what happened was they, they, he, he organized for, for David to be raised away from the affluence. David was removed from the center of influence. He was removed from that affluence. He was stripped of everything that he was born into so that he can have room for God. You see what I mean? Because the Bible says it is in our weakness that the strength of God is made perfect. And so when the other children were enrolled in the army of Israel under the command of Saul and they were gaining ranks. Remember that by the time David was fighting Goliath, some of his brothers were just about a step or two from becoming generals in the army of Saul. Because a couple of years after the conquest of Goliath, they were said to be generals in the army. They were commanders of, of, of legions. And so when you look at those guys, they were increasing. They were increasing and growing in ranks because of the influence of Jesse, their earthly father. But David did not have that influence, so he had to rely solely on God. And so it is not a bad thing for you to find yourself in a situation wherein you have nothing working for you. You have no one working for you. you. Even you are working against yourself. Jesus died for you. He died so that you can enjoy the righteousness, peace, and joy. And still you wake up sad. You wake up depressed. You wake up troubled. Even you are working against you. You understand what I mean? But let me tell you something. When things happen to be working against you, don't think about it as a disadvantage, if anything at all. Register it as a huge deficit that has created a great gap for your heavenly father to fill. The more of him you need is the more of him you can have. So David, while Saul... And some of his goons were teaching the brothers of David how to fight. Nobody was there for David. He was left all by himself. So he had no choice but to turn to God. And that was the reason why he said that it was God who taught my fingers to fight and my hands to war. Because there was nobody who thought he was worthy of anything. Nobody wanted to be associated with him. So in case you haven't thought about this, I want you to revisit some of the disappointments of your life. When people left you, God was orchestrating for you to recognize that he needed to be with you and that you need him to be with you. You see, because man was made in the image and in the likeness of God, so it is very easy for us sometimes to allow other people, because they kind of look like God, to take the place of God. But the reality of it is that it is only an image. It is not the main person. And so no matter how good people are to you, no matter how dependable they are to you, they cannot take the place of God. You see, when Jesus was about to reveal another dimension of the Father to the disciples, the first thing he did was, the Bible says, he drove away the multitude. 
Let's get away, get rid of the crowd. Because that, there was too much noise. And in that time, wherein it was just him and the disciples, they had nothing else to do but to continue to stare at Jesus. They kept looking at him and looking at him and because there was nobody else to look at, it was just Jesus. It was like, okay, we've seen you, but now we have to keep seeing you. And he said, now you got it. He says, because when you've seen me, you have seen the Father. But they didn't come to that place where they were busy trying to, you know, serve people, signing autographs and, and, you know, showing off that they were the inner circle people. You see, sometimes a lot of what we have come to recognize as blessings are actually distractions. The reality of it is that God is bringing everything to you so that you can, he wants to see what name you will call them. You understand what I mean? Because some of us, God brings you opportunities to make money and God is watching you to see whether that is going to become your new God or whether you're just going to see it as a means to do better the things of your assignment. You see, because at the end of the day, it is all the same plan that started that God is still running. The Bible says that God brought all the animals to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever he called them was their name. And so God in his goodness is bringing things your way. But many of us, we have seen the dog and we have called the dog a spouse. Many of us, we are, come on. <laughs> that kind of hit different, didn't it? You know, you see, many of us have seen the bear and called the bear a defender. You see, we have continued to attribute things that belong to God to items that don't belong to us. You see, because at the end of the day, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. You see, quit trying to possess all of these things because the way things work that are caught possession is that they are like a magnet. I cannot have a magnet sticking to a spoon without the spoon sticking to the magnet. So you cannot own a thing without the thing also owning you. So be careful what you take possession of because at the end of the day, because... <laughs> Some of the things that we take possession of end up taking possession of us. And because they do not have the God-given compassion that we have, they become enslavers of us. So David was that man who did not have all of those privileges. Saul had all of those privileges. And so David learned to rely on God, to depend on God. A lot of what was supposed to be his disadvantage. Do you know that when you read the... Um, there are certain texts, certain Jewish texts that were not considered inspired because they were full of details of daily living and, and lives of seemingly ordinary people. I mean, look at how people make their decisions, right? So these texts did not make it into the canon or into what we call scripture today because they were mostly about ordinary people. And you know who one of those ordinary people were? The mother of David. But what they did not know is that the same ordinary text or text that they deem ordinary because they were about ordinary people, were actually, they actually contain a lot of the things that Jesus said. So Jesus must have read those things. I'm sure you all are familiar with the scripture that says that the stone that the builders have rejected is the one that has become the head of the corner. It was David's mother who said that when they could not find a king amongst the boys who lived in the house. The day that Samuel came to anoint, the son, to anoint one of the sons of Jesse as king, they brought all of the big boys, the ones that have enrolled in the army, the one that was in business school, the one that was already an intern with one of the politicians down the road, one of the Sanhedrin. They brought all of these people because they were men of means and capacity. And so they brought all of them, and Samuel kept saying, the reason why you're bringing them is because they look like they can be king. But God is not looking at the appearance. He is looking at the heart. And so after all was said and done, Samuel said, the Lord has rejected all of these dudes that you have brought. And so Jesse was there feeling at a loss, not knowing what else to do because he had so, so long forgotten the bastard child. I tell you what, Sometimes it's a good thing for you to be forgotten. <laughs> because if people remember you before God does, they will assign you to places where they can use you and not God using you. You see, because at the end of the day, nothing gets done on earth without a man or a woman. And so God has people that he's preparing for divine assignments 
But Satan is also looking for recruits and people are also looking for servants. So if they find you before God does and they remember you and you're available, they will apply you in places that could continually limit you. So the story goes that they had completely forgotten David, but Samuel kept insisting that there is another child. You see, there are times wherein we go through situations that have to expose the vanity of the choices that we have made so that we can be compelled to remember the blessings that we have forgotten. You see, the man Jesse got to the point wherein, he, for, for one, he never thought of Josh, David as a blessing, and he never thought of David as anything that he wanted to associate with because David kept reminding him and everybody of his weakness. But I want to tell you there is nothing wrong with others being reminded of your weakness because the same people that have heard about your weakness and your failure are the same, and your failures are the same people that will celebrate with you when the doing of God becomes apparent. You see, that's why the Bible says the Lord prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. The only thing that can make my enemies gather is if there is some bad news about me that someone is bringing to the table. If someone is bringing a plan to expose me or to ridicule me, then you will see all of my enemies come to the table. They would also come and make their own contribution, their own fabricated lies. They're making their own contribution. They're saying, you want to stab Moses? I've got a pocket knife. Someone says, you want to get rid of him? I've got a shotgun. You see, and they're coming and bringing all their stuff to the table. And your heavenly father is there and it's like, okay, we need more knives. We need more knives because I want to make for my son a shield of silver and steel. And these metals have to come from somewhere. One of the grandest edifices ever built was the Temple of Solomon. Do you know where all that gold and silver came from? They came from the conquest of David. There was a time that David and his boys went to war. And the enemy had come against them. Three nations came against them. And they were so confident that they were going to win. And so all their generals came out. And back in the day, soldiers fought with steel. Generals fought with gold and silver. Because their shield had to be special. So they brought all of their spoil. And when the Lord wasted the enemy, and you know what's interesting is they were all wasted on a table. That place geographically is called a plateau. And the plateau is a kind of table that is a natural table on the earth. And so when these people had been wasted upon the table, that was the same table that the Lord had chosen to be the place where that temple is going to rise from. You see, all of that gold and silver came. The Bible says for three days, they were gathering spoil. And so one day I asked the Holy Spirit, I said, you need to tell me. I understand the shield, the golden shield, but the spoil that they gathered for three days, it must be more than golden shield. Because when we read about the things that David had collected, that he had put in the treasury with which Solomon built the temple, we heard that there were silver goblets. So are you going to war and drinking as you're going to war? The Holy Spirit said, let me show you. And he gave me a glimpse of the battlefield. And what had happened was these men, when they were leaving their houses because of all of the other nations that have agreed to go against Israel, and they had measured Israel up and found them not up to par, they said, we are going to win and celebrate. So they already prepared that in the new land that they were conquering, they would set up banquets to celebrate and to party. And that was the reason why they brought the golden goblets and the silver plates. They didn't need those for war. They needed that for celebration. God needs to make your enemies feel so confident against you that they will bring things that they should have left at home just so that you can have it without going to the strange land that they came from. So let them keep bringing all their guns. It is to your advantage. So the mother of David said the stone that the builders, the word builder in the version of the Hebrew language that she spoke, the word builder and brothers is the same thing. So when she said the stone that the builders rejected, she was also saying the stone that the brothers rejected has now become the head of the corner. When did she say that? She didn't say that after David had come. She said that the moment the man of God says there is yet a son. And she knew who that son was because the mother never forgets. 
Jesus says, though they may, yet I will not. That woman did not forget that she's got a boy that was languishing in the backside of the desert. You see, I want to encourage you folks, no matter where you have been, I asked my wife a question today. I said, Rosemary, who are you without the things that you want? Who are you without a man? Who are you without money? Because sometimes we want things as though our lives depend on those things. But we need to know who we are in Christ Jesus, regardless of whether we have a man or not. Regardless of whether we have money yet or not. You need to know who you are. Because if money defines you, you are a slave to mammon. If your position in the church or when your business defines you, you are a slave to that particular title. But if you already know who you are, whether you have a thousand people that you're serving at your church or whether you just have two or three people, then you can truly say you know who you are in Christ. And so the woman of God knew that her son had been chosen by God. Because all the ones with the privileges have been found wanting. I'm going to wrap up on this note. You know this song that we sang today uh, about the new Jerusalem, the bride of Christ, that will come and there will be a great celebration and we, with, we, sh we, we shall be there by the grace of God as the friends of the groom that Jesus says we are. That song, I spoke about it on Saturday and I want to talk about that song again today. Because the revelation, or one of the revelations and insights that I have received from the story of the new Jerusalem, the bride of Christ, has set me free from a lot of ambition. Because I would tell my wife, the way we're building houses is wrong. We need to use materials from the same environment to make it less energy intensive. I always come up with all these ideas. When, when I hear the sound of a car, I'm like, that's not sounding right. When I look at a skyscraper, sometimes I want to weep. I see all of these things, and I'm trying to work out ways to change the world. And one day, the Holy Spirit said to me, he said, if he had an opportunity to change everything that you have ideas about, who will build those things? I said, oh, you will give me people. He said, we can arrange that, but who will build it? I said, men. I said, okay. Then he took me to Revelations, and he showed me a city whose maker and builder is God. So he said to me, which one do you want? A city made by men or one that is made by your heavenly father? I said, are you kidding me? I'll take the one that is made by God. He said, so let your focus be on preparing for that new Jerusalem as opposed to changing this world to look like it. You see, because the reality of it is most times what we are trying to do is we're trying to change things to look like what God already has intended to make them when the time comes. So when you look at our lives today, a lot of the things that we are lacking and a lot of the things that we are missing are the way they are because God is building within you and I a sense of appreciation for the wonder that he has already worked in your name. So that when that time comes, you can say, glory be to God in the highest. You can give all the glory to God rather than tapping yourself on the shoulder and say, look, my hands, I've done this. I come to you today in the mighty name of Jesus to say to you folks that we have come to such a time wherein God is saying I don't want you obsessing about how well you can do things. I don't want you seeking perfection. I don't want you worrying and sorrowing over what you do not have. I want you to let your attention be on me. Because no matter what you have, I am still everything you need. My decision to come out here today to share this with you stems out of an experience that I had in the early hours of this morning. Yesterday, the Lord woke me up and he said to me, 
It says, go to Isaiah 51. I went to Isaiah 51. I read it. It spoke to me, and I fell asleep again. And then this morning, I woke up, and it said to me, because I asked, I said, I've got a lot of things that I want to do, but which one should I do first? I was thinking it, and I'm like, I'm going to go ask Rosemary. I said, what do you think? Do I do this one, or do I do that one? And as I got up, the Holy Spirit said to me, you know what to do. I'm like, oh, well, I need to pick up from where we left off, Isaiah 51. I went back to that verse of scripture. I'm going to show you three verses, and then Alan and Diamond will come up for their testimony. These three verses of scripture. Please, if you haven't taken anything out of today's meeting, I want you to, to, pay, to, pay, I want you to pay close attention. And don't forget, it is not an edifice. It is a sacrifice. Be ready to lay it down. Be ready to let it go. So we're going to read verse 7 of Isaiah chapter 51. The Lord says, listen to me, you who know righteousness. You people in whose heart is my law. Do not fear the reproach of men, nor be afraid of their insults. God says, I don't want you to be afraid of the reproach of men. I don't want you to regard their insults. What is that to you and I? Whenever God says, I don't want you to do a thing, be rest assured, he will give you an opportunity to choose whether you will obey him or not. So when God says, do not be afraid, he will orchestrate for things that are fearful to happen to you. To see whether you will choose to obey him. You see, when God says, do not be afraid, it is not an encouragement. It's not a word of encouragement. When God says, do not be afraid, He's not saying, well, you know, you know how these things are. Just, just try and not be afraid. No, everything that comes out of the mouth of God is a command. If it says do not, he's telling you exactly, he's giving you a command. Why? Because he's the captain of your salvation. And when you are in an army, your superior doesn't give you advice. You don't pick and choose what you want to do. You do all that he said. And before God went in deep with Joshua, he said to him, he said, you must plan and decide to do according to all that I say. Then you will make your way prosperous. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8, and you will have good success. Because he says, I am running a regiment here, and you have to obey everything that I say, because I am God, and you are not. We need to settle that. The Bible says, whoever must come to God must first of all believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Remember where we started this thing from? Was that you need to think of yourself not just as a priest, but think of yourself also as a king. A priest can do its duty, I mean his duties, and receive a commendation. But a king goes beyond seeking recommendation or commendation or approval. A king seeks to obtain a kingdom. And if you're going to obtain a kingdom, you don't just obey instructions enough for you to seem, enough for it to seem like you're doing what you're supposed to do. You do what is needed to do until you have obtained what is needed to be obtained. It is a different mindset, an ownership mindset. When you are a royal priesthood, you carry yourself with grace and you lean on the almighty God for your life to remain honorable. And so God is saying here, do not be afraid. And every time he says, do not do this, do not do that, he will give you an opportunity to see whether you will obey or whether you will chicken out. When he said to Joshua, be bold and be courageous. Do not be afraid. The next thing that happened, he was surrounded by enemies. In fact, he saw an alien, a, a person that looked like a human being, but from a distance, they already could tell that that was not just an ordinary human being. He was probably twice as tall as they were, or maybe his body was glowing, or maybe he was standing next to a vessel that they hadn't seen before. So they were like, we're dead. We're just completely doomed. We're not only fighting men now. We have to fight whatever this is. And so what did Joshua do when everybody was checking out? He, he tried to inch closer to this person and was like, hey, uh, whoever you are, are you for us? 
or are you against us? But imagine how much fear that presented. But he was able to overcome because he obeyed the Lord. Let me say this. I've said this before. When you think about the things that God said in his word that you have always taken as a warning, if you took them as a command, you'll be able to do them more joyfully. Because many of us struggle with not worrying. You know, many of us, you're like, I'm not going to worry. I'm not going to worry. And then the next thing you're like, oh my God, I'm dead. Oh my God, what am I going to do? But you just said you're not going to worry. And that's because you think about not worrying as some kind of, okay, the Bible is advising me not to worry. No, but when you think about it as my father is commanding me, the captain of my salvation has issued a command saying that I should not worry. What do I do? I don't worry. Because if anything happens, he will answer for it. If I'm a soldier and someone tells me to go and stand guard somewhere, whatever happens is not my problem. I was told to go there. And so when the Lord says, do not worry, and I don't worry, it doesn't matter what happens. He said not to worry. If anyone has a problem with me not worrying, you can ask God. He told me to be here and not worry. You understand what I mean? And so what happened was, what happens is, it's empowering to know that you are carrying out the commandments or the instructions of a superior. It just gives you all that confidence. You have the backing of heaven to do whatever, to not worry, to not be afraid. And when the Bible says that you shall not lack, it's telling you that you will not lack. And so if lack comes in, you say, lack, you can't stay here because they told me not to allow you here. And where does it begin? It begins in your thoughts. You start to kick lack out in your thoughts. And if you can succeed at keeping it that big in your mind, in your thinking, in your prayers, and in your planning, it will not come into your account. The Lord says, listen to me, you who know righteousness, you people in whose heart is my law. Do not fear the reproach of men, nor be afraid of their insults. People will have reasons to reproach you. People will have reasons to insult you. And the reason is because they will see your light from the east and they will be intimidated and that's the reason why they want to bring you down. The reason why people talk you down is because they don't like the fact that they're seeing you and you're already up there. You're so well behaved, you're so blessed by God, who do you think you are? People don't like looking up to other people. They don't mind looking down at you for a little while and then they run away from you because when they keep looking down at you, they're afraid that you will bring them down so they don't want to associate with people that are too beneath them. But the people who are above them, in their own thinking, they want to bring them down. They tell you your dress is not nice even though that same dress they've been saving to buy it. I have prophesied over people and the word prophetic word came to pass, but they told me that, it, that they didn't receive it as a word of God so that I don't feel like I'm a prophet. <laughs> and I'm like, keep playing. You think you're hurting me? <laughs> and so people will want to reproach you. They would want to insult you. Whenever they say, who do you think you are? Just say, tell them I'm a king and a priest. Choose one, but whatever you choose, you're getting both. It's two for the price of one. So I'm saying this to you because of the fact that we have taken a stand here at Communion House. And those of our friends who watch our videos who are allowing themselves to bear fruits worthy of repentance, I commend you also and I want you to know that this word is for us all who have chosen to stand on the truth and by the truth because others will try to reproach us. They will call us names if I, after I preached that message on, on Saturday, it aired on Sunday. As soon as, it was, as soon as we posted it, somebody that I know who secretly follows us responded with another post of their own saying that, oh, if you are the enemy of Israel, oh, God is coming for you. And I'm like, well, I am not the enemy of Israel. But so let me, there's a difference, and this is the difference. I am not the enemy of Israel I just happen to be a friend of God. And God is no respecter of persons. God says, look at Jerusalem. I'm going to make sure it gets destroyed. Jeremiah 9, 11. And Jeremiah 9, 13, God says, the reason why I have taken this position is because they did not regard my voice. 
And what was the voice of God that came out in the book of Matthew? This is my beloved son. You know my well please. If you obey him, if you don't obey him, if you don't regard him, Peter came in Acts chapter 4. And he says, these people have not regarded the son of God. They have not regarded Jesus. And he mentioned who they were. Herod, Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles. And I told you the reason why it was with and not and, because the Romans and the barbarians had a pact to rule the world and they're still ruling the world today. That is the reason why any city state that you go to in the world, the buildings are Romans. They're Roman in architecture, but the governance is barbarian. I've told you that before. You don't even have to go to any encyclopedia. Just walk around. Go to any city state, any state capital. If, you, if that's too much trouble, take a tra- trip to Vegas. Because I have worked across so many city states from Abuja in Nigeria to London in England to other places like Vancouver in Canada, to Quebec, different places, come to America, Washington, D.C. I've traveled everywhere, and I didn't get it until one day I was in Vegas for a conference, and I was walking, and the Lord said to me, can you see the 10 toes? I said, I'm wearing shoes. I can't see my toes. He says, no, the 10 toes of the statue that I showed to Daniel, the 10 families, the mix of iron and clay, the barbarians and the Romans. He says, can you see them? I said, no, I can't see them. He says, let me open your eyes. He said to me, he says, look at the architecture, the buildings. And I'm like, this is Caesar Palace, Caesar's Palace. This is the Venetian. This is the, and everything that I was looking at was Roman. All the statues were Roman gods and goddesses. And I'm like, okay, now I see the Romans, thank you. Where are the barbarians? He says, look inside. And when I looked inside at the door, I saw half-naked women. As soon as I walked in, I saw drunken men. As soon as I got to the table, they were gambling. He says, you are welcome. And so you don't have to look far. The same people that had the pact to rule the world, they are everywhere. And what you and I need to know is that when Peter was prophesying, he saw both of them in a pact. That was why he said, Herod, one unit. Pontius Pilate, that represented the Roman government, and the, with the Gentiles, he put them together. And then lastly, he says, and the children of Israel. Are we looking at the scripture? Okay, yeah, as you saw, they are mixed with clay. They will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not be able to adhere to one another just as it doesn't make blah, blah, blah. And all of that, and that is the reason why the, the government or the, 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 the system is called Babylon. Because Babylon means confusion by mixing. The iron and the clay, they haven't mixed, but they are working together. So that's why there's always confusion in the camp. And that is the reason why they have to get the rest of us confused so that they can manage their own confusion while we're busy fighting each other. You understand what I mean? The iron and the clay are at war at, at war with each other even though they have a pact to work together. And that is the reason why you have to either be Republican or Democrat so that there's always constant division, you know, fighting one another. Anyway, the story for another day. We have come to a point in time Alan and Diamond, get ready. I may have to say it one more time, but get ready. Wherein the Lord is saying, these people have chosen to raise their hands against my son. They have not heeded my voice. So I'm not fighting anybody. We're not against anybody. We're too busy to be against anybody. But what we're saying is this. We need to prophesy because the Lord said to us, do not let the men of Anathoth stop you from prophesying. And who are the men of Anathoth? Anathoth means answered prayers. So the men who themselves or the tribe or nation that has been regarded as an answer to prayer is now attempting to stop me from speaking the truth because it doesn't align with their warmongering agenda. I'm sorry, I will not keep quiet because the Lord warned me before the war started. For almost a month, I kept repeating myself here. I kept sounding like a broken record or a scratched CD. I kept saying the same thing. They will try to stop us from prophesying because what God is preparing for us to say will be unpopular. And that was the reason why the Lord took us to the book of Jeremiah. And he said to us, look at the men of Anathoth and look at what they did. They tried to stop my prophets from speaking. But we are going to speak because we're already, it's too late for us not to speak. David says, the zeal of the Lord's house has consumed me and he has turned me into a reproach. He said, I've become a reproach to my mother's children. 
I've become a reproach. I'm no longer popular amongst the people. They don't even want to see my face. But the Lord is telling us here, he says, do not be afraid of their reproach because they will come and they will reproach you. They will insult you. They will call you names. And let me tell you something. This is not even just about us advancing the kingdom. Even in our own individual lives, there are things that God will tell you to do and people will tell you, no one's ever done that in our family. The last person who did that failed. Why do you want to waste your time and money? Why do you want to waste our time? Why do you want to give yourself hopes? Why do you want to do this and do that? Let me tell you something. Regardless of their reproach, the Lord says, don't be afraid. Just keep doing what I have told you to do. Keep doing what I am telling you to do. So seven, and then we'll go to 14 and then 21. 14 says, the captive exile hastens that he may be loosed, that he should not die in the pit, and that his bread should not fail. When you are a captive in exile, when you are in a place wherein another system drives <laughs> your life, the best of you needs to be given to the elite, quote unquote, of the system. The best of your time, the best of your strength. When you are young and strong, you have to serve the system. And then when you're old, then they tell you now you can travel the world. And your eyes are too dim to be able to appreciate the flower beds of Singapore. Neither can you even celebrate the horizons of the beautiful island of seashells. Because while you were young and you could enjoy those things, you were told, no, you need to, you need to sleep first and then enjoy later. But deep within each and every one of us, in this system, the system of this world, that the Bible says Satan is in charge of, the Bible says Satan is the prince of this world, and he runs the world using two of his cohorts, and we know what their names are, God, G-A-D, and Mani, which is M-E-N-I, Isaiah 65, 11. And they represent money and the desire for more money. That's what those two gods mean. You can look up their names. And so... When we are in such a system, there is something within us that keeps telling us that we need to make sure that we don't run out of bread. You are constantly making sure that the bills don't overpower you, that they don't get, that you're not overwhelmed. That before one bill is due, you have paid it. So look at what he says. He says the captive exile hastings that they may be loosed. You want to quickly pay, down, pay off that mortgage. You want to pay off that credit card. You want to be loosed from all those bondage. He says also that they are always concerned that they will not die in the pit. These things are always coming on top of you one bill after another. He says, and you worry also that what? That you will not run out of bread. Let's face it. These are some of the most legit concerns that we face in our lives. You ask your average teenager, what do you want to study when you go to university? They'll be like, oh, I want to be um, an orthopedic surgeon. They're like, oh, you like bones? They're like, no, I like money. The other day, my wife and I, we asked somebody what he wanted to study. And he was like, oh, I want to be a surgeon. And I told my wife immediately, I said, no, he doesn't want to be a surgeon. His mom wants him to be a surgeon. And I was right. So I went to the mother and I said, your son wants to be a surgeon. I see your hand in that decision. And she was like, oh, absolutely, because, you know, they make a lot of money. I said, but he has, he has no interest. I said, he's a math genius. A math and a musical genius. Why would he do that? That's not what he wants to do. I know what he wants to do. And she was like, oh, whatever. That's too much of a risk. I said, look, we have to live above the drive of mama." We have to seek first the kingdom. What is the kingdom? The Bible says the kingdom of God is not in meat, it's not in drink. We're not supposed to be chasing what we are to eat and drink. He said, the Bible says the kingdom is what righteousness, peace, and joy. Being a surgeon is, doesn't feel right with that boy. He will always question the righteousness of that decision. That is not his joy. How, how can he ever have peace? We're supposed to seek righteousness, peace, and joy. But people are seeking money. Why? Because they do not want the bread to fail. Because they want their children to pay their mortgages in five years and not 50. Because they, they want to be loosed from that bond and they want to come out of that pit very quickly. I want to get out very quickly. 
And so we push people in the direction of mammon. And the Lord is saying, these things I want to warn you against in the last days. Three things. One, the reproach of people, their insult, don't care about those things. They didn't bring you here. And they're not the ones to receive you at the finish line. Don't let them give directions to you on how you live your life. Especially what you must say. Speak the mind of God always. Verse 21, and I'm going to close. It says, therefore, please hear this. This is God begging people. I, I hope you know this. From verse 7 to 14, this is God pleading with people. And he says also, your sons, no, verse 21. Therefore, please hear this, you afflicted and drunk, but not with wine. Verse 22 says, thus says the Lord, the Lord your God, who pleased the cause of his people. See, I have taken out of your hand the cup of trembling, the dregs of the cup of my fury. You shall no longer drink of it. The Lord is saying to you, I don't want you to worry about every one of those things because they are my doing to prove you, to see what choices you will make to see what name you will call them. I'm the one bringing all the animals to you to see what name you will call them. That person that came at you as a serpent and bit you, I brought them to see what name you will call, you will call them. That bear that came to scare you out of your garden, I brought them to see what you may call them. He says, don't keep trying to help yourself. Don't keep trying to save your bread. He says, when the time comes, I am still the same one that will remove the cup of fury from your hand. He says that cup of affliction that you have been drinking from, you cannot save your way out of it. Neither can you labor your flesh into safety. He says, I am the one that will remove it when the time comes. But I'm only going to do it for the people who trust me. The people who trust in their own ability, I will let their ability save them in the day. Because whatsoever you make God, will be by your side on the last day. If you make money, your God money is going to be by your side on the last day, but can money save? If you make people your God on the last day, they'll be by your side, but can, can they save? There is only one name under the heavens that has been given unto man by which we might be saved, and it is the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. It is the name of the only begotten Son of God, and so God is saying, I want you to trust me. All of what you're going through is a test so that at the end of the day, you can have a testimony that nobody can deny. So I'm going to remind you of your assignment in this season. Your assignment in this season is to prophesy. Every time you have a thought that says you'll be single until Jesus comes, prophesy. And say, no, the Lord says in his word that he places the solitary in families. I prophesy. When the enemy comes and says, you know, you need to go and get a third job. So because this Bible that you're studying here and this prayer that you're saying is not helping you, you need to go and do what everybody else is doing. Look at all these people. They're beginning to laugh at you. They know you change your car every four years, but now it's eight years and you haven't changed it. Look at the reproach. Let me tell you something. Don't let anybody or any need push you. Prophesy to shut them down so that you can peacefully wait for the Lord to come to remove the affliction. Wait until the Lord blows his own whistle and says, time up. Now we're changing you from this season to the other season. I told you last week that the moment the Lord blew his trumpet and it says that the season for Israel's torment was over, even Balaam, the one that was prophesying against them, started to prophesy for them. It is your assignment to speak and not be afraid. Now, this is something that the Lord said to me because I was asking the Lord. I said, Lord, I need more of an application. I want everybody to get it. Then he gave me this scenario. He says, the men of Anathoth and men whose prayers seem to have been answered because that's their name, the people of answered prayers. He said, now they want to stop you from prophesying. He says, you can give your brothers and sisters this illustration. Men and women around you who seem to be doing well, who seem to have had their prayers answered, they would want to give you advice that is against what the Lord is saying. You would tell them that I'm going to start this business and sell it in two years, and they'll be like, no, no, no. When I sold my business, it took me seven years. 
and then I put it on the market for another five years. So just take, take it easy. Give yourself some time. It's not going to happen. The moment they say it's not going to happen, tell them it will happen. Because the Lord says so. Men of thought, they want to stop you from declaring that which is the mind of God. So when God says to prophesy, it's not just to prophesy about Israel, prophesy about the United States, prophesy about salvation in India. No, he wants you to prophesy even about your own life because God cares so much about you. You know why? Because we have been conditioned to think about countries and nations as big and so because of that they are important. But God says that you are a royal priesthood and you, you are a holy nation. Man, the leader, you are a nation. As far as God is concerned, the way you see Israel and Russia, that's the way God sees you. God sees you as a nation. And you are not a nation of peasants. You are a nation of kings and priests. So every little detail about you is so important to God. So when God says prophesy, prophesy. You are the one to prophesy, not that man of God on TV. You know, we see a lot of people on Instagram and YouTube now, they'll be like, Papa, prophesy. Prophe <laughs> Papa. You cannot outsource your God-given responsibility to somebody else. That is the reason why I'm not going to stand here and people be like, oh, Papa, prophesy. First of all, I ain't nobody's Papa. Because Jesus says, do not call anybody Father because only one is your Father. I am your brother, not the Lord of your faith, but the helper of your joy. Because we are in this thing together. I'm not going to allow anybody to elevate me to a place that God has not put me. You understand what I mean? And so, don't be asking other people to prophesy. If they prophesy, God is good. But you yourself prophesy. Don't let the ones who seem to have had their prayers answered shut you down. You too prophesy. Look yourself in the mirror and prophesy. Say like Adam and Diamond, we are signs and wonders. Prophesy. Praise the Lord. And Alan is not as long-winded as me, so we're going to be out of here in 10 minutes. Praise the Lord. God is good. Come on, y'all. I know, man. Come on, dude. God is good. Family, we are here to celebrate. Gavin, if you would. Thank you, sir. Oh, thank you. Thank you, sir. That's right, man. Do y'all see this here? Okay. Uh-huh, uh-huh. It's hitting y'all now. October 7th, Saturday, we were leaving here, and as we were closing up, my wife and children had went ahead, and shortly after we locked up here, we hit the road, or I did, and my wife and I were on the phone, and we were encouraging each other in the things of God, talking about the message and what we had been experiencing that week, when suddenly I heard my wife screaming, and I heard crashing and loud noises. We were on Bluetooth. I'm in one car, she's ahead of me. And um, as I heard her crying out the name of the Lord, and the phone cut out. I said, okay, Jesus. And I thought to call the man of God. And I had felt resistance from my father to say, hold on. And I'm glad he didn't pick up because it allowed for me to experience the Lord for myself. And so, earlier that day, we had been, the woman of God had come ministering that we're signs and wonders. And by this time, the accident had occurred. The phone had shut out. I tried to call back. It was going straight to voicemail. And so, what ended up happening is that I called my father and said, hey, Diamond and the babies have just been in an accident. He was not far from where we were on the freeway. So I was shortly behind them. The accident had occurred, and my father had already gone ahead. Y'all going to hear something here. And um, 
About two minutes after the phone had disconnected, I received a notification from her phone that a crash had been detected. And it sent me the coordinates and I drove to that place near Memorial Drive, the on-ramp there, the exit ramp. And I got to that place and I saw my wife's car in a ditch. You see it here. And as I got to that place, I saw my wife coming around the car and someone had my son and someone else had my daughter and my wife was getting herself situated out of the car. And when I got to that place, before I could even greet them, the Holy Spirit took over in praise and adoration to the Most High God. Listen, listen, listen. I want y'all to hear this. Because the Lord will make it such that you exhibit what is deep down, what he wants to see out of you. But it's not just for him. It is for you too. Because sometimes, can you imagine hearing as a husband your wife and children screaming on the phone and you can't do nothing about it? You're not in control. And so by the time I got there, I saw again my child in someone else's arms, both of them, my wife getting out, and there was such an electric atmosphere at the scene of the accident. As I replayed it, I said, Lord, I knew there were more people there that I saw and that I didn't see. Family, we have declared so much we've come to the company of innumerable angels, of just men made perfect. When I got there, someone had already stopped and had come to help all of the doors that you see there, well, you can't see the others, all of the doors except for one, which was the passenger right, could open. So when the accident occurred, Diamond had to crawl through the back, get the babies out of the car seats and come out of the door while all of the car seats were still attached. I'm not gonna revelate too deep, but I have a prayer for us all tonight. The first man that I encountered that night was a man by the name of Donald. Whether I was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. But the man of God has ministered to us the meaning of the name Donald, which is world ruler. And the second that I encountered someone else that came out of the blue, her name, Keturah, which comes from the name Keturah in the Hebrew, which means incense. And so what the Lord revealed to me was that he had prepared a place for us to be in contact. He had prepared the altar for he was there, the world ruler. He had built up the incense. Now he needed the fire to erect the flame. And so when I had come, I boast not of myself, but of the Holy Ghost, because it was he that took over me to give God praise. Family, when I got there, I had to just look and make contact with the stars, something higher than myself to give God praise. Right in that very moment, we had made contact with the Godhead and had come into the company of innumerable angels. Family, my prayer is that you experience the eternal flame that I encountered that night. The fire from the most high God, listen, and listen clearly, this is the season that the Lord has seen fit to be glorified in your life. Family, we have been in the midst of the holy ones. We have been in the midst of those before the altar because when I came out of that place, I was fired up all night. Many of, much of this I cannot articulate, but it's a trust deep down that has been activated within me. And it is my prayer for you all, as many that want to receive, that need this type of activation. Because family, what I'm sharing with you tonight is the gift of special faith. Because you need a different type of trust in the Lord. Because the scriptures say, all that believe in me, if you have faith, you will say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea. Family, your money ain't going to save. Do you know we were on hold with DeKalb County for I don't know how long before they got there? 
Do you know that we were on hold waiting for the EMS to get there? I don't know how long before they got there, but men were sent. The place was already prepared. My father had just gone ahead. Hear what I said? My father had already gone ahead of us. He had turned around on Memorial and came back up the freeway. He was there. We were met with such speed from heaven. And you see my children here had come out of that thing. Look at the radio, all dismantled. Look at the side of the vehicle there. The car tow up, but my children still built up. My wife still built up in the things of God. I, had, I come here to testify of what the Lord has done. And my encouragement to you, we need covering in this time. You can't be out here without a covering. Family, we come before you as signs and wonders, as ministering spirits, as flames of fire, that you encounter the Lord for yourself because this presence that we have been in, it is for us all. Family, I celebrate you. I thank you for how encouraging you have been to my family, how you have kept us lifted up, the man and woman of God that have been in our life. Family, we wanted to celebrate with you what the Lord has done in our life, and if you would, give him a shout of praise for what he has done. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. Guys, you know we don't joke with testimonies here. You're going to stand up. We're going to come with a loud shout. We're going to say, thank you, Jesus. We have come back to say, thank you, Jesus. The Lord said, we are not going to be the ones doing the signs and wonders. Remember the prayers that Saturday, that what God will do, people will say, this is the end of God. When the Lord speaks, don't joke with what the Lord is doing. Each one of us, we're going to have testimonies. This is only the beginning. Can you imagine? Israel is only two months old. There will be no death at communion house. <laughs> with long life, the Lord will satisfy us. Satan cannot take us out. I want you to praise God. Hey, I want you to give my God big praise. Praise him. Shout to the rooftop. Father, we thank you. Lord, we glorify you. Oh, Lord, we thank you. I have just been praising God. We will not hear bad news concerning our family. You all, our family, will pray. Not because you guys are here. Behind you guys, we cover you guys. We'll pray. Imagine three people. Today is their wedding anniversary. Imagine the, 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 um, the celebration you had for us. But God said no. Remember pastor said on Saturday that when Satan was coming for him, he saw a vision and the spirits of death. Who remember that when he was preaching? He just said it like that. He said, when the spirits of death came, he came on his, on his shoulder and the hand of the Lord said, take your hands off. This is the testimony. Because you know what Satan wants to do? Strike the sheep Strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. But God said, no. Communion house, these are my people. My hand is upon this one. And so I want us to praise God tonight. And say, Father, we have come back with a loud shout. We have come to say thank you, Lord. We say thank you, Father. We give you praise. Thank you that we are praising you tonight. We recognize your goodness. Look at the cars, the glasses, the windscreens. They all broke. They shattered, but you kept them. They went to the hospital and they were cleared. Father, we praise you. We say thank you. My Lord and my God, our defender, our protector, we have come to say thank you, Father. We give you praise. We exalt you in the mighty name of Jesus. And once more, we say we are for signs and wonder. Praise the Lord. God is good. All righty. God is good. Praise the Lord. 
Hallelujah. Let's celebrate these guys once again and thank God for their lives. Hallelujah. Can you please help me grab my glasses? Can we be seated for one more minute and we'll be out of here shortly? Um, it's a special celebration today all around. And so um, if we stay a little longer, please let's, all, let's remember that. Um, so we will come around our time of giving in just a moment. But before then, um, I have an announcement to make. Who is making the announcements tonight? Chris, Taylor, Alan? Okay, you already. Okay, I have one of my own. Um, and the announcement is that on Saturday, I will be making an announcement. Yes. So that's an incentive for you to come. Oh, yeah. And you don't want to miss that announcement because you are, a, you are very much a part of the announcement. The announcement is I want to share with us a vision of something that the Lord revealed to me concerning us. And it happened right here. And so I want you to come out on Saturday. I, I'm so fired up about it. I don't want to get started and not be able to do justice. So on Saturday, there's a special announcement. In the meantime, as we package our offerings, I also want us to, do we have communion? Yes, let us break bread. Um, even though we've already eaten together, but let's still do this together. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So very quickly, if you can help me with that Bible, because we always like to read a scripture as we break bread. So come with me very quickly if you have, uh, whether you have received the, the sacraments or not, I mean the bread and the wine or not, uh, just come with me to Revelations 21 very quickly. 21.14, Revelations 21.14. Um, uh, what, what I'm saying, uh, what I'm about to share with you is a screen with which you're going to behold what's going on in the world so that you can interpret it correctly. Okay, so 2114, and what does it say? It says, now the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The city, we're talking about the new Jerusalem. Okay, so for those people who have heard me say, that we are the friends of the groom because Jesus says that we are the friends of the groom. He says, no longer do I call you servants, but I call you friends. When Jesus was asked, saying, how come the disciples of John fast, the Pharisees fast, but your disciples don't fast? He says, the friends of the groom don't have to fast when the groom is with them. You understand what I mean? But for some reason, some people have told us that we are not the friends of the groom, that we are the, that we are the bride. And I tell you the danger of taking that out of context and seeing us as the bride is rather than helping the groom to receive his bride, our focus is on ourselves. Most times brides are focused on them and they expect everybody to be focused on them. I am the bride, you need to do my makeup. You need to put my gown on. You need to do this and that. And isn't that true of most of our Christian gatherings today wherein individuals have become so entitled and so self-centered. Everything is about them because they think they are the bride. But when you are the friend of the bridegroom, you are always at the service of the bridegroom to make sure that nothing goes wrong, that everything is fulfilled. Now, come with me, Revelation chapter 21, verse 9. The Bible says, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me, saying, and this is one of the latest visions that I've had of heaven, which I haven't even shared with anybody. I haven't even told my wife to see it. But this is one of the, I've seen the seventh angel. And he says, come and I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. The bread, the what? The lamb's wife. And who is it? He says, and he carried me away in the spirit to a great and a high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. I am not here to bleed, praying for a Jerusalem on the ground that is experiencing the judgment of God when I'm supposed to be praying for the Jerusalem that is coming from God, whose maker and builder is God. Let us free our minds from mental slavery. We have been set free to receive that which God has made, not to battle for what is under judgment. Having the glory of God, her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. That city is called the Lamb's Wife. And I am a friend of the groom. 
That's the only label that I'm willing to accept. They can call me an enemy of the state. They can call me an enemy of this and that. But it don't matter what anybody says because the Lord already told me to care nothing about their reproach. Simply because the Lord has called me his friend. So we're going to break bread with 21, 14. I got excited real quickly there. That's amazing. The Bible says, now the wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The significance of this is this. The Lord has chosen to immortalize the obedient ones. The word apostle means the ones that were sent. And the ones that were called apostles in the Bible were not just sent, they went. You understand what I mean? And that is the reason why every single one of them kept talking about the fact that they have fulfilled their call. They have run their race. As we break bread today, I want you to be reminded of what really matters. What matters is not the edifice that you can build, the following that you can amass, the amount of money that you can get, the investments that you can make, those things are important as tools for you to fulfill your assignment, raising children, having a godly family, not having to worry about the mundane things, great. But the reality of it is we need to be reminded that we have an assignment by God because that is the only part of us that becomes immortal. The apostles' names were written into the foundation. The Lord wants to immortalize your assignment only if you do his will. So as we break bread today, I want you to make a fresh commitment in your heart and say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus said, as much as often as you have the opportunity, do this in remembrance of me. And as soon as he was done breaking bread, the next thing that happened was he was in the garden of Gethsemane. And he, he told his disciples, we are all tired and we, we feel faint. But be reminded, men ought always to pray and not faint. And they kept sleeping anyway. And Jesus prayed and he says, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. As we are getting close to this next phase, as we are going through this transition that the Lord has so eloquently by the unction of the Holy Spirit described to us, let us make sure that we say the same prayer that Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done. I am offering you today that which my heavenly father and yours showed to me the Lord is offering to you an opportunity to find it easy. He says, my burden is light, my yoke is easy. He's letting you receive it as a commandment today so that you know heaven is behind you so that it is easy for you to deny yourself and embrace the cross. Not my will, but yours be done. Every one of us will break bread, but I want to pray for three or four people in particular who are saying today's message has spoken to me. And I know that the Lord is inviting me to turn a new leaf. I don't want to be like the Pharisees that showed up at the Jordan, but yet not repentant. Repentant. I want to say that I am turning a new leaf the day. I want to live my life as a spirit on earth, having a human experience whose dedication is to God's kingdom and the will of the Almighty. If that is you today and you say, I'm coming out just so that I can be in full fulfillment of all righteousness, I want you to come out right now. I would love to lay my hands on you, shake hands with you. I want to be a part of this moment because I know this is a joyful moment, a gracious moment. And so if you are one of such people and you want to come out, come out real quick. There's not going to be any ceremony. I may just high five you and let you go back to your seat. But let it be known that of a truth, you are setting a mark in the sand of time. To say that from now on, the rest of my life is about his will and not mine. Father, in Jesus' name, if you would step closer, you're going to break your break bread afterwards. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for these ones that have come forth today. Thank you because they have come to you and not to man. And you said, whosoever comes to you, you will in no wise cast out. You have been received into the embrace of your heavenly Father for this commitment to become fruitful. In the mighty name of Jesus, once you have the grace and the mercy, be rest assured you will be fruitful in this new commitment. Your eye will continue to behold the light that will lead you 
in righteousness for his name's sake. In Jesus' name. Alrighty, Sammy, you come close to. Father, I thank you because today marks the beginning of the rest of his life wherein he gets to walk constantly before you as a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar person in the company of innumerable angels. Get fired up, my friend. It is your season. In the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you for my friend Just, Justin. Justin, come close. Father, I thank you, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, for your watch says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst, for they shall be filled. And I pray for you today in the mighty name of Jesus. As soon as I placed my hand on your shoulder, I saw you and your family members, one of them in particular. I can tell you who it is later. And what you're watching on the TV, they're looking, but they cannot see what you're seeing. And you kept saying to them, can't you see? And suddenly, a hand brought you a remote control. And the moment you press the button, then they could see what you're seeing. There is a channel that has been opened to you where God is allowing you to see things ahead of other people. But the Lord also brings you the wisdom with which to be able to share with them that which you see, that they may have understanding. So do not be dismayed if there is a season wherein you're pointing things out in the spirit and they cannot see it. Do not worry that same hand. I have already seen it. It is the hand of God's intervention. The hand of God's favor will bring you the wisdom that you need to be able to bring others into the visions that you see in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray for you as I release you forth also in the mighty name of Jesus into this ministry of a watchman to see ahead in the name of Jesus. Father, you are great and greatly to be praised. Hallelujah. As much as I am mindful of us going home, I want to say like David says, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. We live, let me speak for myself, I live for moments like this wherein God gives us an opportunity to experience the transformation in the life of a man. Sometimes it is not a whole nation that is at stake. Sometimes it is just one destiny because that nation rests on that destiny. Nineveh needed Jonah. Hey, let him who has an ear hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the churches in God. Thank you, Jesus. Let us partake of the Lord's body and drink of his blood. Father, we thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for offering up your body and thank you for giving us a way of doing it in remembrance of you without having to slaughter any more animals. He said, this bread is my body. This wine is my blood. And as we do so today, we do so in obedience and in remembrance of you. You may eat and drink. Praise the Lord. So you know Sammy, I'm going to tell you this, the mom. When I told him that he was getting into a new lease of life and it was going to be the beginning of the rest of his life, the angel of the Lord came to him in the room that he was and he told him to take his things and that he was coming into another room. I saw him, he took his beddings and he had a book in his hands. Might be a Bible or a journal, I couldn't tell, but he took his things and then he went into this other room. And so I want to encourage you just know for a fact that the Lord is bringing your son closer to the fire of the altar. In the mighty name of Jesus. You see, because Samuel had to get away from where his room was to go sleep right next to the fire. And that was when he heard the voice of the Lord. And your son's name is also Samuel, isn't it? It's over. Let us bless the offering. Praise the Lord. God is good. Father, we give you praise. We thank you for this great assignment that you have invited us to be a part of. Thank you, Father, because of the preparation. And also thank you because when the time comes, Lord, we will go where we need to be. But now we thank you for how you continue to teach our fingers to fight and for our hands to also learn how to war. 
We are not afraid of their reproach. We do not regard their jesting. If anything at all, Father, we stand tall, knowing fully well that our Redeemer lives. In Jesus' name, communion house, prophesy. God bless you. So offering envelopes I've been giving out right now, I believe. If you need an offering envelope, there's always one here that you can grab afterwards or you can raise your hand right now and my brother Kenyatta is going to get one across to you. And um, I want us to just take a moment. We're not going to rush through it today because sometimes we rush through it. If you've already scheduled a giving online or if you've given online, praise God for you. In a moment, you'll get to raise your phone. Uh, but if you're packaging an offering today, don't be in a hurry. Take your time. The offering envelope is going to get to you. But I want us to just say thank you to God for this house and for how he has seen us through and continues to see us through. And also ask that you may see more into the part that he has for you to play in this special forces regiment, this unit of heaven, this special forces unit that the Lord is raising here at Communion House because there is more to be done and he is sending laborers into the field. We are the sent ones. And our work shall be immortalized by heaven because it's not going to be the works of pleasure unto us, but it will be the works of obedience and righteousness unto God. And so as we just say that prayer, let us be ready to commit ourselves, not just to saying the prayer, but to obeying what is being said by the Lord. Father, we thank you. I'm going to give you a moment right here. And then we're going to proceed with the word of prayer. All righty. So, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you uh, for the opportunity that we have to be co-laborers with you, to be contributors. As we contribute out of that which you have given to us, to the needs of the house, to the work that you are doing, but more importantly, to be able to contribute in your name, to say that I bring this in the name of my Father and his kingdom here on the earth. I give in his name. Father, we thank you for that privilege. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Alrighty, our time is fast spent, so the offering bowls are going to be here. If you have a, uh, an envelope or, 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 or cash that you want to put in, just come and find Kenyatta afterwards, and we're going to close out the service in just a moment. Any announcement that is very critical? Alrighty. So I encourage you guys, come out on Saturday. God has great things for you and I in this place. Thank you, Communion House, once again for celebrating my wife and I today. And the rest of the leaders, we appreciate you all greatly. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you.